Hey everyone, this is Kieran. Today's exercise is about improving your ankle flexibility going forwards. So this is going to be the kind of flexibility that is required when you're doing things like squatting or going downstairs, even potentially with a little bit of walking. Um, so if you feel like you've had some trouble with that, either through an injury or it's something that you feel is restricting your ability to uh, increase or progress in exercise, then give this video a watch. Okay, so when we're seeing a lot of this stuff talked about and prescribed um, through various channels, I think a few joints and aspects of a foot get moved, uh, forgotten, I suppose, or, or left out. Um, but you can kind of get a little more detail on this, and I'll link it in the video, is going into the mechanics around supination and pronation. And in the video, I talk a little bit about it with a, a model of the foot here. but you start thinking about the foot as three regions or three sections and you've got the rear foot which is kind of the heel and this sort of ankle joint here the Taylor cruel joint and then you've got the midfoot which is kind of like the wrist bones and the wrist it's these carpal uh, sorry cuneiform sorry along with your navicular and your cuboid bones sitting in the middle here that's your midfoot and your forefoot is going to be all these sort of toe bones in here and when we're thinking about something like a squat or going into a really deep lunge or going down stairs, there has to be an expression of movement throughout this whole region. And I see a lot of exercises emphasizing some Taylor cruel joint um, components and inadvertently you're gonna get some subtalar stuff as well down here, that little heel wiggle. But it, it's, it's not enough sometimes and it's, it's not always uh, the cause of someone's problem. And so when it works, it works. And you should know pretty quickly with these types of things if they're gonna help or not. Um, in the basics though, we're looking at this idea of pronation and supination. Pronation is an expression of all three regions of the foot and it's an ability for that arch to collapse. And it gets a bad reputation, but it's a good thing and it gives us a, a trampoline-like shock absorption and allows us to then propel and recoil upwards. So what's going to happen is when I land, my ankle is going to need to go forward. So this is my shin bone here. You can imagine my arm is an extension of that and there's my knee. It's going to go forwards like this. So that's that movement there. The midfoot needs to go into an inversion, so it has to spin this way, and the arch needs to collapse. The heel, the bottom of the heel, so here and the ball of the foot here, they need to get further away. They need to open out like the like a big rubber band under here, stretching out. And then the forefoot needs to be able to go sideways. It needs to be able to spin outwards like this so that you can get this full expression of pronation. And what that would look like here, obviously I've got my shoes on, but it would look like an ability to really get down into these types of positions. And so my whole foot's collapsing under here. And I've got that whole thing where the, the heel is moving away from the ball of the foot and creating distance here. And I'm not seeing it as much with the toes, but relative to the rear foot, they're going out to the side. So all these things need to be considered when we're considering, 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 but all these things need to be considered when you're looking at what exercise could be useful. And so how do you know? You gotta decide what part of the foot is restricted, or you could just try them all and see what works, okay? Um, so let's go over a couple straightforward tests, and let's see uh, what you might find is uh, restricted for you. So one of the first tests we can look at is a common test that's used around the kind of knee to wall kind of test. Um, I think it gets used in a way that is less reproducible in terms of measurement for that individual. Um, it also takes a lot of the load component out of it too. And a lot of the times when there's load involved, we might see less range expressed or less flexibility. And, and that's a reflection of a few other variables we'll talk about. But when we're thinking about mobility restriction or flexibility restriction, it could be for a couple of reasons. And one of them could be weakness. That weakness could be from previous injury, or it could be from like a, like, a, like a protective response. So maybe somewhere else is weak and that muscle is clamping down to create tension or stability. So this test isn't necessarily gonna tell us those things, but what it will tell us is that there is a restriction and afterwards you can retest and see if it's better, okay? So 
what you're going to do is touch the toe to the wall, the front foot, and you're going to line up in tandem. So, straight as line as you can, and then as you see from the front, I'm going forward like this. From here, I'm really trying to get this knee forward as far as it'll go, okay? And you're like, well, how do I measure that? I mean, you can look down, for example, or, and I'll put a link to it in the description. You can get an app for your phone and you'll need someone to help out with this. It's called a clinometer, basically a goniometer, but digital. You put it on the shin and then as you go forward like this and backwards, you'll get a reading of how many degrees it is. And so for squatting, I'd be wanting to see like, you know, 45 plus degrees. Some people are gonna get 60. Some people are going to get 30. It just depends on what you do in your injury history. So you're going to go forward, 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 and then you're going to switch and do the other side and go forward, 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 okay? And that range is expressive of what you would do with, say, a squat, okay? So uh, a second fairly practical test is to do a squat. What we can do, though, is use the wall as a bit of a guide. And a wall squat test is a nice teaching tool because it also teaches us around how much pelvic control we have. And that can be a component here in losing ankle flexibility as well, where the ankle flexibility is less so an issue of the, the ankle and more of a loss of tension around the pelvis. And so your ankle tenses up to stop you falling over. Not a great strategy for long-term heavy loads, but something that is uh, practical in, in like a reflexive situation. So I'm gonna choose my width and I'm gonna go toes about half my foot from the wall. So you could measure that if you wanted. And then as I go down, I just wanna see if I can get close to the wall or touch without falling over. Okay. And I'm gonna get a little bit closer. Good, and so I can touch there. And I can still look forward against the wall. And what you find for a lot of people is they'll probably fall over. And that's just more an expression of this kind of stuff at the back, that pelvis control and the ankle itself is tensing up to stop you from falling. And that looks like tension at the front of the shin. So what it could look like is the toes lifting off. I'm at the edge of my balance. See my toes are starting to lift off. It's because my pelvis is so far back and I can't control the mass of it. I can't create an equal force that opposes the weight of that pelvis and therefore I fall backwards and my shin muscles are trying to stop that from happening by pulling me forwards, okay? So not super exact, not something you're gonna put a clean measure on, but you're looking for a change afterwards. You'd look to see this feels easier or harder. So the first exercise we're gonna look at combines the whole foot and a lot of these exercises do combine the whole foot. The difference in the exercises is where we're putting our leverage point. And so as far as leverage points go, we're thinking about points of contact with the foot on the ground. So we have to have the heel to consider. We have to have the outside of the foot to consider. And we have to have the inside through this big toe. And it's kind of like a tripod, right? We've got one, two, and three. And those three points give us a sense of stability. That stability doesn't need to be rigid though. A rubber band is still stable under stretch. There's a passive tension there that allows it to do what it needs to do. And when we're thinking about the foot and pronation, there's an element of passive tension through joint tissues, uh, capsules, ligaments, tendons, and then there's an active component too, which is the muscle lengthening under load. But the thing is, is each of these contact points need to have an ability to create force into the ground. And it, that ability will be reflected in the muscles that move those joints. Okay, so this first one is talking a little bit more about this rear foot, Taylor cruel area, and not so much the subtalar, but definitely through the midfoot, particularly through the inside here, and is gonna be helpful for getting that E version or that midfoot to go this way, and for the big toe and the rest of the toes to AB duct out to the side, and it's called a perineal raise, and that's that muscle that comes down the outside, swoops underneath and attaches underneath into here, into that medial cuneiform and the first ray over here, okay? So they control it inside of the foot. And I've got another video of this if you want to watch it just concentrated, but pretty much it's a calf raise where my feet are turned out to the side. To get the ankle dorsiflexion component though, we're going to be leaning forward so that my ankle has to go into more dorsiflexion instead of being just upright. So if I'm off to the side like this with my feet and I go up and down, 
Now I'm creating a fixation point through that big toe knuckle in here. And then when I come up, I'm making sure that I really push through the inside of my foot. I'm not rolling out to the side like this. I'm really pushing through the inside, okay? And I'm making sure that I keep that contact as I go up and down. Now, eventually, if you've got a one-sided problem, or you've had a previous history of like an ankle sprain, this might be a muscle which needs some rehab for you. So make sure you do a single leg as well. And that would just mean bringing the foot more to the center, and then you're trying to go up and down like this. Up and down, up and down, so you feel a sense of fatigue. You might get some feeling out through here. And then what you would do afterwards is you would go and retest those other two things we did. So the wall uh, dorsiflexion test with the two ankles in tandem going against and then the squat as well. And then you'd be able to test by coming in and seeing, okay, does that knee go over more easily? Do I feel more sense of ease in my squat? Can I be here under rest? Do I feel like my foot arch is collapsing a little bit more? So next exercise is looking at more, again, the dorsiflexion component, but now we're trying to create a fixation point between the front of the foot, so at that forefoot area, and that's gonna be through that big toe again, and also that little toe, or that fifth MTPJ. So this, basically that knuckle in there and that knuckle here, we really need to make sure we're creating force through those areas, and that creates something as an anchor while the talocrural joint is moving. And so that gives us a sense of, say, when you're squatting, if I'm coming forward like this, or in a lunge, I can create pressure through the front of my foot. If I can't do that, then what I'll end up doing is creating it, say, with the ends of the tips of my toes. And that's not a bad thing, it's just those muscles are a lot less robust, I'm not gonna be able to create as high levels of force, and so it means it's gonna impact your ability to squat heavier loads or lunge heavier loads. And inadvertently, what you end up with is less flexibility because your brain goes, whoa, that's not safe, and so here we are. So, seated calf raise, I recommend, um, if you've got access to it, definitely go for the machine version if you've got one of these at your gym. Um, again, this isn't a concentrated version, we've got a separate video for it, but you know, the, these muscles are very strong, and so you need heavy, heavy loads because muscles respond to load, and if a muscle is strong and capable and you're asking it to do light work, that's all it'll do. It's like saying, well, you know, I need you to do something without an incentive. And so these muscles respond to heavy loads. Muscles feel through stretch. So we need to go through a stretching phase. And then that heavy load enables uh, or encourages a muscle to recruit more of itself. So a greater percentage of motor units. And we're not going to get it unless there's two scenarios. We've got heavy load or we go to fatigue. Not necessarily failure, but we go to fatigue. Okay? So... This is 20 kilos. If you're doing a seated calf raise machine, you may well get this up to 100 kilos on both legs, maybe 50, 60 on one leg. Um, sometimes I'll do this with some plates. This is a setup you can do to start with. Just get a stair. You can see my legs kind of in a bit of a squatty type position. I mean, not that this is like a functional training thing, but it's just, you know, if we can replicate the joint mechanics, that's great. I've got the weight up there. And now what I'm doing is I'm pushing the weight up to the sky but I'm really making sure that I'm pushing through that big toe knuckle and the little toe knuckle. And I'll show you a different angle on it in a second, but you can see I'm creating a fixation point. Yes, those joints are moving, but I'm creating tension. So I'm moving under tension. And then I'm asking that talocrural joint to be a little bit more mobile. And it's at the very bottom that we're looking to improve as well. So my toes are coming off and I'm really resting through the ball of that foot and then pushing up, and then down, okay? So the ability for these muscles to take load is gonna allow you to take the load as you go down into a squat. You'll start to feel a bit of fatigue coming into this muscle here, okay? From that other angle, if I was here, you can see that coming up, I'm putting through the ball and through the outside, so there's a little bit of that twist at the top, right? So we call that supination. And that's where we're creating a nice rigid foot at the top. That's the opposite of pronation rigidity versus like a soft, flexible, supple pronation. And I'm up, up, up. But I'm not taking this off the contact point. Okay. So give that a go. And then afterwards, do your retests. 
with the two things and see if your ability to squat, so that ability to come down, has improved, or maybe it hasn't, and we need to try something a little more heel oriented, which we're going to do next. So lastly, with the tripod that we're talking about, we've worked on that big toe knuckle, which has its own kind of role in pronation and supination. It's just a, a stronger, more robust lever for creating or leveraging movement off of. And we've got our sort of combination of the forefoot, which you need for when you go down and your weight's going forward, you got to have that ability to push yourself back up, right? And now we also have our heel. And the heel connection is an interesting one because there's no, um, when we think about the joint itself, what we have really only attaching to it is gonna be some muscles on the bottom of the foot and our sort of, you know, uh, tricep psoas or gastroxyleal complex, right? Very vertically orientated muscles are sagittal dominance, so forward and back. So this ability just to go forward and back. So because of that forward and back ability, what you need to think about is if there's restriction in that forward and back ability, and I'm not able to put weight through the heel in a way that is consistent throughout the whole depth of the squat, then you have to start thinking about other parts of the chain, right? And so we haven't talked a lot about the full mechanics of this yet, but when you squat, it's not always about seeing the flexibility. And I think this gets missed a little bit is it's about more about being able to oppose forces or oppose mass. And then can you move within whatever space you're in and stay stable and basically not fall over or get you know squashed by whatever you're doing or, you know, land reliably and change direction, et cetera. So when you're going down, you need to be able to maintain weight through the heel. If you don't, then one of two things will happen. You'll either shift forward, right? So I'm gonna put weight into the front of my foot. Maybe I have a reliable anchor there, or I'm gonna keep going backwards and I'm gonna fall, okay? Because that's what a squat is, is. It's a demonstration of sagittal balance. You've got a very wide sideways base of support so it's very unlikely that you're gonna fall sideways. But the base of support for forward and back is the distance or the length of your foot. That's your base of support. And so your mass has to stay within that base of support, or at least if it goes outside of that, you have to be able to control it, either with a, a flexibility option, so you're bringing your mass into the center or closer to the center of your foot, or you're controlling the actual mass of it. So the weight of my pelvis, those muscles have to be able to pull hard enough to oppose that weight or my rib cage as it goes this way. Same with the barbell. When you're going down, ideally you want that barbell to go right down the middle of the foot throughout the whole squat. And you know you're staying in the center of the base of support, okay? So what we want to do is to, to teach the situation. We want it to be a bit of a reactive situation. So horse squats are really nice because they narrow down the sagittal balance situation. They make it a smaller base of support, or not necessarily base of support, but they give you a less, less ability to move outside of it, okay? And so your restrictions are gonna be obvious because you're gonna hit them sooner. And what we can do is various steps. You could do this just to your regular squat width, or you could do it to a larger amount. This might be how you work towards like a side split or a pancakey thing to stretch out your adductors but we're using it for a different reason here. So I'm gonna go one, two, three. Most people are probably gonna stop around here unless you're doing like a big sumo squat or a sumo deadlift. You could go four, five, and then beyond this, we're obviously starting to get into other types of goals. So like six and seven, this is a different kind of scenario and that's, see, that's my ability there. Whereas if I come back into five, then I can sit down a lot more, all right? From the side, what we're seeing though, is if I sit down, if I lean forward a bit, I'm gonna fall a lot sooner. If I lean backwards a bit, I'm gonna fall a lot sooner. And so we need you to just build confidence in the heel, and you're gonna do that by being able to control your pelvis. And so if you create an anterior tilt, or just tilt your pelvis forward a bit, to feel your lower back tighten up, don't go past the depth where it starts to tilt back this way. It's not a bad thing, it's just not the focus of this exercise. So you're gonna tilt, 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 and you're gonna come down, and so you can hold it. 
Now I could say, where's the weight of my feet here? It's kind of going forward. So I want to bring it into my heels. And that means that my lower back has to tighten up more. Otherwise, I'm going to fall. So if I don't let my lower back tighten, if I round, like what we're saying, don't avoid, see how I fall backwards? But if I tighten the lower back, then I can learn to be here, okay? So you're going to work up to maybe minute holds on this and get comfortable with whatever width um, allows you, whether it's three, five, or seven, probably within a three to five range. And then you're going to look at trying to stay on your heels, okay? And afterwards, as always, retest. So recheck your squat. And you might find that your pelvis can come over your foot much easier. So it's going to make balance a lot easier because it's not way back here. You might find you can just sit a little more upright, but more importantly, I can put weight in my heels and be quite happy here, okay? So bringing everything together, we're starting to consider, you know, what's, what's the carryover here? And we've talked about fixation points at the foot. Now, it doesn't mean that the foot has to be supple and go into a full relaxed pronation. That's more of a resting squat, right? That's a, okay, I'm creating distal length, I'm relaxing while I create tension further up with the other muscle attachments conversation for another video but when you're looking at the squatting element it's okay the depth obviously you're getting your ankle symptoms or other symptoms but then also the different styles of squatting and so different styles of squatting are going to suit different people based on what restriction they have if they have a difficulty with weight being in their heel they're probably going to struggle a bit more with a barbell back squat because the weight's sitting on the back and they're already having difficulty controlling weight going backwards. So they might benefit a little bit more from like weight in the front, so like a front squat or a zercher squat or a goblet squat. And then you get them to shift their hips back and it'll teach them to put weight into their heels with a counterbalance, right? The opposite's true. If someone's having difficulty getting that dorsiflexion at the tailor cruel joint or maybe that full pronation, then they might benefit a little bit more with the weight on their back, helping push them down and forward. And actually what you'll find is some people will say, my mobility is better once I'm loaded up. It's harder at lower weights or at body weight squats. Okay? So just to give you an idea of what that might look like and to enhance it, not to say you need to squat this way because everyone's anatomy is a little bit different, but whether you're gonna go for a wider stance like we showed you in the horse stance, or you're gonna go for a more narrow squat, the difference is in how am I going to control my balance, okay? If you're in that wider stance we talked about, you have less room for error for forward and back. So you need to be very rigid in the forward and back ability. That's going to be through your lower back and some tummy stuff. And then you might create like a, a spreading of the floor to create tension sideways so that you don't fall as much forward or back. If you're going for a more narrow stance, then you need to think about creating force forward and back to bias the change that we're looking for. So if I go for a barbell forward, uh, sorry, a barbell back squat with a narrow stance, then I'll show you front on and side on. But what I want to try and do is touch the, uh, the windows with my knees. And it's going to encourage that dorsiflexion. And if I just give myself that one external cue, I'm already biased towards weight going in front. So I'm not doing so much of a hip hingey squat but it's going to encourage a fixation point through the front of the ankles. And as I come down and come down, yes, my back might be rounding a little bit, but it's not the focus right now. So I can pull myself forward like this, right? But that's because I'm reaching forward with my knees and it just cues everything else to happen and try and touch that wall. So that external cue is going to be the difference. Okay. The weight's helping to push me forward into the balls of my feet. Now, if I wanted to cue into a barbell squat, uh, sorry, a barbell uh, hip hinge squat, then I might do a paused version where I reach backwards like this and put weight more into my heels and be a little bit happier this way. Same width and then coming up, okay? We talked about the front squat variations and the zercher squat. Let's show you, let's see how the mechanics of this thing works show you from the front. So if I come down and I'm reaching towards you guys with my knees, just making sure I don't hit the squat rack and I'm coming forward like that. Okay. Pushing up into the bar with my back and then coming back up versus 
reaching back like this, not so much an ankle flexibility thing, more of a hip and lower back challenge. All right, so a lot of information. Afterwards, as always, go to the, uh, do the retest, do your front squat um, where you're facing the wall, and then do the uh, dorsiflexion wall test and see if these things feel improved or you'll just feel like the squat's improving as your awareness of where these anchors are on the feet improve. So I hope this helps. If, um, leave some questions. Happy to hear from you guys. And uh, of course, watch some of our other videos if you find this helpful. If you like this video, then please hit like below. Otherwise, to check out more of our content in the future, you can subscribe to our channel by clicking our logo over here. And to check out our latest video, click up here.